Hi, everyone. Cheryl Cran here. I'm really excited for this podcast episode on the Next Now podcast series. I have with me today a very special guest, Stephen Bailey. Stephen Bailey is the co-founder and CEO of Exec Online, the pioneer of online leadership development for enterprises. Stephen oversees the organization's strategic vision and broader efforts to engage with corporations to create a diverse pool of future-ready leaders. Since its inception in 2012, Stephen has raised nearly 90 million, building the company into a leadership development powerhouse that works with Fortune 500 and Global 2000 companies, NGOs, and government agencies. Under his leadership, Exec Online has grown to now include partnerships with 12 of the world's leading business schools and was named as top tech company to watch by Forbes. Yay. Thanks for joining us, Stephen. And I've also had the privilege of partnering with Exec Online to provide some courses on remote workplace. And Stephen has also um, endorsed my book, Super Crucial Human. So it's a joy to have you today, Stephen. Really glad to have you here. Cheryl, so excited to be doing this with you. And it's been such a great partnership. Yeah, wonderful. Let's let's jump right into it for the listeners, because I know they're eager to hear what you have to say. So Exec Online specializes in providing online learning learning, pardon me, for leaders and teams. Why do you think that what Exec Online offers is so relevant for the now workplace, but also for the future workplace? That's a great question. And, you know, when we sort of think about where we are in the current economy, um, we've coined this phrase of the learning economy. Um, And what that really means is in the current environment, we think competitive success, both individually as leaders, as well as at the organizational level will be increasingly defined by the ability to learn Mm. and specifically learn faster than the pace of change. If individuals and organizations are able to learn faster than the pace of change, then that represents competitive advantage. And if they're learning slower than the pace of change, that's where competitive risk lies. And so increasingly, we're seeing learning, particularly leadership development, move to the top of the C-suite agenda because organizations are recognizing the need to develop and maintain that strategic capability. And one of the big shifts in leadership development as this has evolved is the need to move from leadership development as a tap on the shoulder resource for a handful of leaders to a much more democratized resource that's available to all leaders as a critical way to engage, incent, and retain talent, but also in recognition of the fact that every leader needs to stay ahead of the pace of change if strategy is going to be effectively executed in the organization. Yeah, brilliant. And this is why I'm so excited to have you on because it completely aligns with what we we do at Next Mapping as well, which is if you can't elevate learning at the speed of change, then you are going to be left behind. And we're seeing this happen in organizations. We're seeing it happen. And I love how you said democratizing leadership and, and, and the education of it, because really one of the things we say is in the future of work, everyone is a leader. Now that we don't mean that by title, but we mean it by attribute and skill ability. Would you agree with that? I'm going a little bit off script here, but I just would love to hear your insight on that. Well, yeah. I love when, when we go off script. It's yeah. so much more fun. Um, exactly. So, <laughs> absolutely. I, you know, we believe that there's a leader inside of each of us. Yeah. And Executive Line's mission is to connect all leaders to their future potential. And so it's really unleashing mm-hmm. that leader inside mm-hmm. of each of us. Um, if you think about historically leadership progression in organizations, it's been way too limited. And as a result, when you look at leadership pipelines and then ultimately the senior leadership of organizations, we don't see the diversity that we should. And organizations have for many years put band-aids on this through pure talent acquisition. So, oh, we're lacking diversity at this level of leadership. Let's go and recruit more women or more minorities or whatever the sort of uh, diversity metric might be. And what you find, right, is that doesn't really build more diverse leadership capacity in our broader economy. All it does is just shift talent around. And so the, the problem is going to move maybe from one organization to another, but the, mm-hmm. the problem is still very acute. And so our goal is to really diversify leadership pipelines, make those pipelines much more inclusive mm-hmm. by allowing organizations to democratize access to high quality leadership development that moves the dial for anything from an aspiring leader up through senior leaders in the organization. And when organizations do that well, now they're building a strategic capability that not only allows them to execute strategy, but also allows them to build a much more diverse um, leadership bench over time. 
Mm-hmm. No, I think that's brilliant. I mean, the when you say that, I find that tr- that's true with our clients as well, is that they're looking for that Band-Aid solution w- instead of looking at what's going on inside the organization and what are the opportunities with the people that we have. And the diversity lends itself to competitive advantage and diversity. We know this. We've known it for years, but I think now we've, we're moving away from lip service to companies actually feeling the reality of this. So you just actually sort of answered question number two, which I had on the script, which was, you know, what are some of the trends and patterns that you're seeing with clients that are using your exec online services? Like, what are their common challenges? Like, why are they coming to you and going, okay, we need this now? Yeah, so we've we've got a a, what we call a future ready leaders framework Uh um, to help organizations understand, you know, what are the critical capabilities that leaders need to build? And it's going to be some variance by organization, by individual. But generally, we see three broad um, capabilities that are critical. One um, is the ability to lead business transformation uh-huh. and really understanding the pace at which competitive landscapes are changing. We take COVID, for example, when we asked our leaders, you know, what, what are you seeing? The ma- significant majority of them sort of said, look, the way we're accessing our customers which is pretty fundamental to any business model is, is changing. And so the ability to stay ahead of that, mm-hmm. to have the business acumen to understand the business today, and then the strategic acumen to understand how to map a plan for where to take the business is really critical. The second bucket is what we call empathetic leadership, the ability to meet your teams where they are, particularly in the context of significant change, both professionally, personally, um, and to connect with your teams and help them take that journey with you is critical, not just as as, as team members of your organization, but as whole people, right, um, and that truly believe that you're investing in them. And that, that means understanding different perspectives. That means being a, an effective coach to your team, those sorts of capabilities. The third bucket is what we call inclusive leadership um, and the ability to lead increasingly diverse teams in an inclusive way. Um, if you look at the data, the highest performing teams and organizations are diverse teams, the lowest yeah. performing teams and organizations are diverse teams, and the difference is um, successful and inclusive leadership. Right, exactly. Yeah, no, that's excellent. So um, how has, I'm going to throw a little bit of a, what, our pre-discussion into this next question, how has you being a debater in your, uh, you said you were on the debate team in your younger years, how has that helped you in your shaping of your CEO role and what you're doing with, with Exec Online? I think that's an interesting psychological connection, actually. Yeah, so um, I debated for uh, all four years of high school and, and four years of college. Actually, my debate partner in college is still my best friend to oh. uh, this day, uh, Kamal. Um, and um, and what it I think debate teaches you fundamentally that's super relevant to effective leadership is to see different perspectives. Mm-hmm. So in a, in a, when you debate, you take different sides of an argument at different points, right? And so you can't just see one side. You've got to see both. And that has helped me sort of understand, um, or at least, you know, it's always a work in progress, but but to continue to get better at understanding different people's perspectives, different approaches to problems. I think it helps you innovate um, in some pretty unique ways. And so when I think about my um, academic journey, Mm -hmm. um, debate has been as big of an influencer in um, my development as an individual, as a leader, um, than anything else that, that I experienced during my, my time in high school or college or grad school, for that matter. Yeah, that's fascinating. In my new book, I talk about uh, conscious communication, and I think that is a critical, super crucial human skill for leaders and teams as we move forward. So by being able to have multiple perspectives, that's something that you developed through that, which is awesome. I feel it's a skill that more and more leaders need to be able to develop. And conceptually, a lot of leaders get it. But to put that into practice, and I I find with us, with a lot of the coaching and consulting that we do, it's talking to a leader and they'll say, well, I have multiple perspectives and I'll challenge them on that and go, okay, well, wait a minute. How does, how does your frontline worker see this situation then? And they can't answer that question. So, so that multiple perspectives, you're right. It helped, you have to, had to analyze it from a variety of angles and not have a subjective view of those angles, but an objective view so that you could intelligently communicate it. So I think that's that's an awesome key to your success. So, so why is Exec Online courses, what, what makes you unique to the marketplace? Like, why do you have the success you're having with your clients? Why do they keep coming to you for your online courses? 
Well, I think, you know, we, from the very earliest days of Exec Online, we were really, so So what we pioneered was online leadership development. Um, mm-hmm. So 10 years ago, it's hard to imagine now, if you ask an organization, what are you doing to develop your leaders online? The thought was, you can't develop leaders online. That's got to be in person. Online right. is for compliance training or skills development. And what we said was, actually, you can do it, and you can do it in a real high-quality way, in some ways better than what you can do in person, because you can leverage the fact that you can meet leaders where they are and have them apply what they're learning in real time, right? Which is the way that we start to, you know, sort of soak in learning and actually, you know, sort of um, embedded in what we're doing each and every day. And so we really focus on changing mindsets and behaviors of leaders. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And we do that through an applied learning methodology. And so every leader, no matter what program they're in that we offer, and we offer about a hundred different programs today, um, is before they're consuming any content, they're selecting a business challenge Mm -hmm. or opportunity that they want to solve, right? Specifically within their, you know, sort of world. So nothing theoretical. Um, And then they're leveraging what they're learning in the particular program to get after that challenge or opportunity um, and putting together an implementation plan for what they're going to do coming out. And we find that that approach of putting the business need first and then the Mm -hmm. content Mm -hmm. as a support after Mm-hmm. drives different in kind levels of engagement. So we see completion rates in our programs between 80 and 90%, and also different in kind application after the program. And we actually measure what happens to those different implementation plans over a 12 month period and report that back to organizations. Yeah, no, and that's why I I really appreciate what you guys do. And I believe in it so strongly because it lines up with our belief of real-time learning. So even as you know, colleges and universities are struggling with enrollment. And the reason for that is you might learn something theoretically, but to apply it and to embed it in the culture is the missing piece. And I believe that is what Exec Online does and offers is that real-time learning that can be applied in situations that are relevant and therefore you're seeing that uptake and that value because if you look at you know online courses of the past and I'm guilty of this by the way you know you do video training and you're you know presupposing a lot of those challenges but it's not lining up with the real time challenges and I think that's what you've done very well yeah yeah and and, and you know kudos to our school partners and our faculty yes who've embraced a new way of doing things. Mm -hmm. Um, Typically, if you were going to develop an in-person executive education or leadership development program, you would start with content. Yes. That's what's very comfortable to faculty. Um, What our faculty have done, and and you've participated in this process with us, (laughs) did it very well, is to sort of say, you know, okay, actually, I'll think about something a little different. And let's actually start with business problems and what assignments, activities do we want leaders to be able to engage in in order to get after those business problems. And then actually let's focus on the content last as a support for what they're trying to actually do. And that fundamental re um, reshaping of, of kind of the design process has led to a lot of the engagement and success that we've seen in partnership with great subject matter experts like yourself. Yeah. And kudos to you because that does require like people who are attached to their content um, that they want to, they want to develop that's, you know, curriculum development is based. So kudos to you for flipping that model. And I've always been about that. Like what's the problem we're trying to solve because otherwise we're just throwing something and hoping that it's going to stick. Right. So I, yeah, it's, it's awesome. So, so let's ask, let's, let's put your futurist hat on right now. And In your opinion, what do you think the future workplace looks like? I mean, look, we've been through the pandemic. We're still sort of in it, depending on location. But, you know, we're firmly in hybrid workplace. What what do you what are your thoughts? Yeah, so I think the hybrid workplace certainly sustains um, over time. Um, I think where we land on that spectrum between totally digital versus Mm -hmm. totally in person is still a bit up in the air. And I think it's going to vary to some extent by organization. It's also going to vary even within organizations with different functions. Mm -hmm. But the ability to offer flexible work is here to stay. I think it's here to stay because it's much more um, inclusive. Um, You can tap into talent in different places. You can engage talent that are at different life stages. So for example, young mothers who maybe can't come into the office Mm -hmm. every day that still can be tremendous contributors to the organization. Um, And so that ability to engage talent more inclusively, I think is a huge plus. I also believe that organizations that are able to work hybridly can engage different learning um, styles in organizations. Some people execute better 
right? When they're digital, some people yep. execute better when they're in person. And so those different leadership styles, those different learning styles are best engaged in that format. I think organizations that are ultimately going to be successful going forward are going to embrace the new normal, because I do think we'll look back on it in 10 years. And it's the sort of thing where we'll say, well, gosh, that was actually a debate about where we're going to land. It's sort of like the debate over yeah. the internet. Oh, it's just a fad. And we yeah. look back and laugh about it. <laughs> It'll be the totally. same thing. Um, and totally. so organizations that embrace that change, build new leadership capabilities around that shift in the way we work are ultimately the organizations that are going to come out on top. Yeah, I agreed. And I still have the, the you know, I, I work with a lot of organizations. I still have a few CEOs. Who, oh, we're going back to in the office. And I'm like, yeah, no, we're not. <laughs> reality, <laughs> reality check. And to your point, some people are better suited for digital. Others are better suited for in office. So I don't think it's going to be a one or the other. I do think it's going to continue to be an integrated hybrid as well. So it's, I, I'm pleased that I'm not surprised that you'd have that similar view. So, hey, we've heard all about the great resignation. I've done podcasts on the great resignation. I've done a lot of stuff around it's a worker's market. And what we've seen as a major shift in the last decade is, you know, a decade ago, the employer held all the cards. They told you how much money you were going to make. They gave you your vacation. They told you your hours. Now pandemic happens. And this was happening pre-pandemic. We actually predicted at Next Mapping that remote work would be a thing by this year, but we didn't know the pandemic was going to happen. But we predicted it based on worker attitudes, worker shifts, looking at those patterns. You know, I believe we're in a worker's market permanently. That's my personal, based on all the research. I'd love to get your insight in that. A worker's market, meaning they hold the cards. They decide where they work, how they're going to work, how often they're going to work. What are your thoughts? Well, I think that's certainly the case for the most sought after um, and high value um, skill sets. Um, so, you know, if we think about the future of, you know, kind of whether you're looking at, you know, sort of tech whether you're looking at, you know, great sales and, 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 you know, sort of customer engagement talent, I think it's going to be a long run of, of, of a talent driven market, uh -huh. right. In organizations, you just look at the data around the shortages there, right. And it, it yeah. sort of jumps off the page. Yeah. And so certainly when organizations think about how they're going to differentiate themselves in this, in this, you know, sort of future of, you know, talent holding more of the cards, I think a lot of it comes back to an evolving employee value proposition. Yes. Particularly around employees wanting to understand not just how you're going to compensate me, right? Mm -hmm. um, but also how are you investing in me as I think about my career in a world where I'm going to need to reinvent myself every few years. Um, and so I think that's often what distinguishes the best talent is they have that mindset of, reinvention, consistent self-improvement, and organizations that don't see that as their role mm -hmm. are going to have a really difficult time retaining that top talent. Organizations that do see that as their role and invest strategically can really win this war for talent in outsized ways. And we sort of talk about it as, you know, as an organization, can you turn that great resignation into a great revival Absolutely. and a competitive advantage for you yeah. as, as you move forward. Yeah. And I think you just answered it beautifully is that, you know, in, in the old school ways, it was like, well, if we pay them more money, they'll stay. Absolutely not true. If it goes back to your comment about if we have more engaged leaders, leaders who have a developed skill set, people will stay for leaders who are inspiring, who have emotional intelligence, who can manage and lead a diverse team. But they'll also stay for organizations that invest in their growth and learning with no attachment to how long they're going to stick around. Right. That's right. So, yeah. That's so that's correct. Yeah, no. So, so um, I think we're getting close to time here, but I was going to just ask a final question. How can exec online help leaders and teams prepare for the future of work now from, you know, obviously the organizations you work with fortune 500 global 2000. Um, how do you think you're an integral part of that future readiness for organizations? So we've put um, a lot of our focus on democratization of learning, right? And so we've launched the first ever um, true leadership development platform for the enterprise. Mm. Um, for the first time, leaders, an organization can provide all of their leaders with access to world-class leadership development for a fixed fee based on the size of the organization and no longer have to rely on these exclusionary models that only offer development to a handful of folks. Uh -huh. As we do that, we've also worked with about three dozen of our companies to think about 
the future of equitable leadership development. We've developed um, a concept called development equity. Think about it as, as pay equity, mm-hmm. but for development. Mm-hmm. Are you distributing development opportunity in this learning economy in a way that's equitable? Because we've got a tremendous opportunity, if we do that well, to close a lot of these um, diversity gaps that we see at the leadership level of organizations. But if we don't do it well, there's a tremendous risk that will backslide. Um, and so we want to very much be at the forefront of both enabling um, this, um, th- this investment in equitable development from a technology perspective, but also pushing the thinking of organizations, making sure they're measuring the distribution development in the right ways and holding themselves accountable um, for equitable development as we move forward. Mm-hmm. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. I mean, we could talk for hours, right, Stephen? I feel like <laughs> I feel like we're, we're. I agree. Yeah, we're so enthused <laughs> and engaged about what we're doing, and really, like, I honestly, my mission has always been like change the world through business. In other words, if we can get organizations to become uh, developed, uh, you know, and, and to be able to leaders to be able to lead in an inspiring and inclusive and engaged way, I really think we can change the world. And I don't mean that with any sort of rose-colored glasses. Do you do you agree with that? Like that's so. I- so I said this to, we actually literally just had an all hands meeting um, a couple of days ago. We're celebrating our, um, our 10th anniversary. Um, and so um, big, big year for us. Um, and what I said to the organization is, you know, in many ways we're, especially in the media, we're hearing a lot about the negatives around the current world we live in. It's unpredictable, whether it's COVID, whether it's just happening in Ukraine. And we can often feel a sense of powerlessness around our ability to impact the world for the better. Um, The positive of the moment we're in right now is that never before in human history can such a small number of people, like second line is around 300 people, and never before can 300 people impact the world in such huge ways, right, by leveraging technology and innovation. And so every day we wake up inspired, not to say that some of the challenges we face are intimidating, but we wake up inspired that the 300 people that Tech Online has pulled together can truly change the world for the better. And I think if we all take that approach, um, we can see the glass is half full rather than half empty. Yeah. And I love what you said in my new book. That's exactly like I call myself a pragmatic optimist. And I I agree with you. We're, we're not negating the challenges of the world, Ukraine and, and all these things that were. However, it's going to be the mindset of looking for inspiring that's going to shift everything. And I think that that's what Exec Online is doing. It's certainly my work. It's just, it's just been a true pleasure to have you on the podcast. I know that the listeners are probably just like jumping up and down with excitement about what you, what you shared. So thank you for your time and um, just appreciate you, appreciate our partnership and looking forward to maybe a future podcast as well, if you're, if you're willing. Absolutely. I've loved the conversation and and certainly appreciate you having me on. It's been uh, it's been very energizing. So I'm going to go. We're going to get back to changing the world. Exactly right. (laughs) Thanks so much, Stephen. And thank you to all our listeners. Take care. Take care.